everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're thankful that you could join us here tonight. And I want to tell you that this week, um, as we've been studying the closing crisis, I hope that you have a renewed appreciation, not only for what Jesus went through in His final moments here on earth, but for what we will have to face as we approach the second coming of Jesus. Tonight, I am going to share with you, my sermon title tonight is called The Faith of Jesus, but before I launch into that, uh, I do want to take a quick detour on the road to Calvary. Now, yesterday, we briefly, briefly touched on the trials of Jesus. Now, there's a reason I didn't spend a lot of time. You see, tomorrow, I will spend the entire sermon hour going through the trial of Jesus from the standpoint of Pilate and Herod. We'll spend the entire sermon hour doing that. But for tonight, or I should say last night, I just covered an overview that Jesus went through seven tribunals. Uh, He was tested. He was beaten. He was lied about. And we saw the parallel of what God's people will have to face and the endurance that they will need. But tonight, I want to take a moment to talk with you a little bit about a man that comes to us in the gospel account of Jesus going to Calvary. If you have your Bibles tonight, can I ask you to please open them? And if you will come with me to the gospel of Mark... And I want to ask you to come with me to Mark chapter 15. And we're going to look at verse 21. Mark chapter 15. And we start in verse 21. Now, you have to understand where we are after the sentencing by Pilate. Jesus was now uh, asked or compelled to carry the cross on what's now called the Via Dolorosa on the, the, the way to Golgotha. And in so doing, along the way, somewhere along the way, Jesus' physical nature began to give way. The soldiers recognized that Jesus was weak. As they began to see the need for someone to help him, Someone expressed sympathy at the plight of Jesus. That was Simon of Cyrene. And as Simon expressed this, the soldiers in verse 21, and they compel. Now, this word compel is probably not as forceful uh, as in the original language. The idea was that they used what was customary in that time. Um, Some scholars refer to it as requisitioning, in the sense that if a Roman soldier needed something to accomplish a task, he could possess an animal, he could take a person, and he could force them by the tapping of the spear to do whatever it was that needed to be done. This was law. They couldn't fight against this. And so the Bible says that they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now, I I, I want to tell you that the story of Simon of Cyrene is not given a lot of information, or there's not a lot of uh, information about him in the Bible. But I do want to read to you a a little section from the book Desire of Ages, because this little insight will help us flesh out a little bit of the experience of Simon. It says, Simon had heard of Jesus. His sons, who are mentioned there in verse 21, were what? They were believers in the Savior, but he himself was not a disciple. The bearing of the cross to Calvary was a blessing to Simon, and he was ever after grateful for this providence. It led him to take upon himself 
the cross of Christ from choice and ever cheerfully stand beneath its burden. Now, tonight I want to spend some time talking about Simon of Cyrene, and there's a reason why, because, you see, as I shared with you the first night, there are things that Jesus went through that we shall not have to go through, because Jesus was our substitute, amen? And while Jesus' life is, is an example for us, there are definitely things that Jesus did for us that we, show, we thankfully don't have to go through. But in the experience of Simon of Cyrene, I believe that there are lessons to be learned by every Christian today. Jesus said, if any of you will be my disciple, let him deny himself and do what? take up his cross. Is there a cross for you and I to bear? There is. And so as we look at the story of Simon of Cyrene tonight, I want you to keep in mind that while this was a real event, Simon took the literal cross, there are spiritual lessons for us to learn from that account. Now, the first thing I'd like you to notice is that the Bible says that they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country. Now, a little background. Simon was from northern Africa. Today, we would say he was from Libya. And his journey to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover was probably an 800-mile journey. He probably had to ride a boat for some of the way. He also had to travel for some of that way. But the point is that Simon was not a native to that part of the world, but rather, like, a, like other Jews... He was finding himself there at the time of the Passover. Now, what, what the Bible tells us about Simon in this verse gives us a little insight as to what suddenly changed in this fateful moment. Because it says that Simon was from Cyrene. In other words, he was from far away. This wasn't his home. And it says that he was coming out of the country. In other words, he hadn't even been in Jerusalem up until that point, but rather he was making his way towards Jerusalem. And as he comes upon the crowd, little does he realize that Jesus is passing by at this time. And as fate would have it, when Simon expressed sympathy at that time, key moment as Jesus passed by, perhaps fainting under the burden of the cross. The soldiers saw him, and they, the Bible says they compelled, they forced him to take up the cross. Now, I want you to know that I believe that there are no coincidences in life. I'm going to say that again. I believe that as we live our daily lives, there is not a single thing that providence does not allow or that just simply happens by happenstance, but I believe that all of these events that take place like a wheel within a wheel are ordered as seemingly chaotic as they might be, are ordered by a divine hand that guides the planets in their orbits and guides all of the things that happen all has been predetermined and it has a purpose by God. And that day when Simon was walking by, as he comes to that place in the crowd to see Jesus, and as he expresses that sympathy, they choose him, and now Simon is carrying the cross. I want you to know that perhaps Simon never realized that in that one day, in that one day, his life would suddenly, drastically change. You know, when you go through the Bible, there are a number of stories in Scripture where one fateful moment changes the course of a person's life forever. I know that you know this. Think with me for a moment. When you go through Scripture, I know that you can think of Joseph. Remember Joseph? Joseph in one day 
went from a prisoner to being the second to Pharaoh. Isn't that right? It, he went from the bottom of the bottom to being almost the, the, the greatest man in Egypt. In one day, his life completely changed. I could go through other people in the Bible who fate tapped on the shoulder. You think of the story of Moses. Moses one day found himself face to face with a bush that would not be consumed. And in that one fateful moment, Moses went from a shepherd of Midian to becoming the leader of over a million and a half people that lived Egypt in the time of the Exodus. In one day, in one fateful moment. We could go through more stories in the Bible. Think of Abraham. The Bible simply says that God called Abraham, and Abraham went out not knowing whither he went. God said, Abraham, I want you to go to this place called Canaan. And as Abraham leaves, in that fateful moment, he becomes the ancestor to the people of God. You know, as we look at these stories in the Bible, little do we realize that one day can make a tremendous difference if we can only understand how everything that God allows has a purpose and a plan for us. You know what that tells me? It tells me that we can't start a day on our own without having devotions and asking God to live in our lives and to guide us for that very day. Amen? Every day we should look at it pregnant with possibilities of what and how God might want us to live that particular day. So Simon is tapped, he's called, he's asked, he's forced to carry the cross for Jesus. Now, if you look at some of these commentaries that exist today, some translations actually say that Simon carried the the back end of the cross. Now, I know that most of us, when we picture the cross, we picture like a, like a T, right? We, you know, kind of like railroad ties, you know, these, like a T-like structure. But not all scholars are agreed that that's what the cross looked like. There's different ideas about what the cross looked like. But the point is that most scholars believe, or I should say several scholars have noted that the, the original language indicates that it may be that while Jesus was still carrying the cross, Simon was asked to help carry it with Jesus. In other words, he might have had the lighter end as Jesus carried the heavier end. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about this story for just a moment. Because at that point in the story... If anybody should have been helping Jesus carry the cross, you know who it should have been? It should have been his disciples. Isn't that right? In fact, if I'm thinking right, Jesus also had a disciple whose name was Simon. Isn't that true? He did. But you know what happened to him? He ran away. And you know what's amazing is that even though Simon ran away, God found another Simon to take his place. You know, I've learned something. When I study the Bible, it's clear to me that God is not dependent on us to fulfill his work. Can I show you from the Bible? Come with me to the book of Esther, if you will. This is perhaps more clearly illustrated here than in any other story in the Bible. Esther, I want to ask you to come with me to Esther chapter 4. And I want you to look with me at verse 14. Esther chapter 4. And I want you to look with me at verse 14. Here the Bible says, now this is Mordecai speaking, and he says to Esther, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, 
Then shall their enlargement and what else? Deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be what? Destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? You know what he was saying to Esther? He sent this messenger, and this is what he's saying. Esther, if you get cold feet and you decide you're not going to do this, I want you to know that God is going to deliver his people some other way. But if you choose not to be involved, it will mean the destruction of you and your family. But just know, God is still going to deliver his people. In other words, God is not depending on you, or he's not dependent on you, but maybe God allowed you to be here at this time because he wants to use you for such a time as this. Folks, I want you to know that there was a time in my life when I felt like, you know, I have a gift, I have a talent, and without me, there's a part of God's vineyard that's just not going to make it. But you know what I learned? When you have that kind of mentality, God can easily set you aside. God is not dependent on any of us, but he wants to use us, and he wants us in the process of being used to experience the power of salvation. Amen? But you know, Simon Peter should have been there. And when he ran away, God raised up another Simon, a complete stranger. And God used that man. And by using him, Simon found Jesus by himself. None of us are too important that God cannot raise up stones to cry out. Now, you know, I'm going to ask you to come with me to the Gospel of Matthew because... This passage, Matthew chapter 16, if you'll turn there, is really the application of this story. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Tonight I want to talk to you about what it means to bear the cross. And can I say that these days in the Christian world... It seems that this idea of bearing the cross is not really mentioned. The, the general evangelical Christian world, some of them are caught up in this prosperity gospel. The idea that, you know, God will, will defer to you and he'll, if you pray the right prayer and you say this, God will just bless you and you'll be financially blessed. And, you know, this kind of mentality exists in the Christian world today, but it seems like they ignore passages like this one. Matthew 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up his what? Cross and follow me. Now, this language is figurative. I think most people know. Now, some of you might know that during the Easter season, so it's coming up, and in the Philippines... They every year have a man who carries a cross. And I think, don't quote me on this, but I think that he actually experiences crucifixion. Yeah, okay, they do, yeah. Yeah, right. And they don't kill him, but you know, they they do this this rich this like passion play that culminates in this man being crucified. And you know what's interesting is that while that may be very graphic and that might help people. The truth is that this is the furthest thing from the, what Jesus meant when he said, take up your cross. And, you know, let's be specific now. What does it mean to take up the cross? Now, if you were with us on our previous nights, we talked about Gethsemane. When Jesus began to bear the weight of the sin of the world. And one of the things that I shared with you, I emphasize this. Jesus' human nature naturally shrank from the cup of suffering that he was about to drink. Does that make sense? In other words, Jesus' human nature, it did not desire or it did not long for that, that separation and the displeasure and the, and the, 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 the wrath of the fire. It didn't, didn't long for that. And so when Jesus prayed, he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, I want you to think in your mind, 
Because when Jesus prayed that prayer, it showed that in taking the cross, Jesus had to deny his natural human inclination to fulfill what the Father's will was for him. In each Christian's life, there are things that go against our natural human nature, but are in harmony with our Heavenly Father's will. I want to be very practical tonight with you. I had a seminar guest in North Carolina. I was holding a meeting in a little church called the Burnsville Church. And there we had a a guest come. Her name was Diane. And Diane came every night. And she wanted to, she had never heard prophecy explained from the Bible. She learned these truths and she was on fire. She wanted to follow. So we made an invitation for baptism. She accepted. But when she accepted that invitation, unbeknownst to her, her husband was very unhappy. He didn't say anything when she was coming, but when she made the decision to be baptized, he specifically told her, don't get baptized. So she told us, she told the pastor and I, and when we heard, we said, Diane, the Bible is clear. If any man loves a person more than God, he's not worthy to be Jesus' disciple. And we showed that from the Bible. So with that in mind, she said, okay, I'm going to get baptized. But her husband wasn't going to leave it. He was a security guard, and he called up the church, and he said, I don't want my wife getting baptized. He said, she won't get baptized. And he said, I'm going to come tomorrow to make sure that she doesn't get baptized. So I had never, this was like the second evangelistic meeting I ever held with Amazing Facts. I I didn't, they didn't give us a a lecture on this part, you know. So I didn't know, you know, and so in my mind, I thought tomorrow I'm just going to tell the pastor to talk to the guy, you know. But when he came, he came to church in the morning. And when he came to church, I looked for the pastor, but he was gone. <laughs> so I met, I met the, the man in the foyer, and he pulled me aside. We went into a side room because we didn't want to make a commotion, but everybody in the church knew what was going on. And we went into a little room to the side, and he said, why are you doing this? Why are you causing disharmony in my home? Now, I got to be honest with you. I didn't even know how to answer that. I I didn't know what to say, you know, because I was thinking to myself, how do you, you know, how do you respond to that? So he said, you know, what you're doing is wrong. You're causing problems for us. And all I could say, all the only answer I could think of was that I know that by doing this, she's following what Jesus wants her to do. And you know what? She ended up getting baptized that day. I'm sorry. And so, you know, it was one of those instances where even though we knew that she was going to face some problems at home, we knew that this wasn't going to just go away, she made the decision to follow Jesus even though it wasn't going to be easy. Now, folks, I got to tell you that Many people choose the easier path because they would rather not have conflict. Isn't that true? Like, that's pretty common. And so, like, you know, with work, you know, if you have a conflict at work, you know, you'd rather just go in instead of having to have a hassle, you know, and so on and so forth. And so sometimes people just do this. But Diane, she stood up. She said, no, you know, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what Jesus gave us an example to do. She made the decision to be baptized. And when she got baptized, lo and behold, you know, with bated breath, we were waiting to see what was going to happen. Because, you know, you know, you've seen this before. People get baptized, and then after a few weeks or months, they just fall away. You've seen that before, right? And look, for us as evangelists, it breaks our heart. Because we know that they were under conviction. But she made the decision, 
And I actually, at that time, I was giving my email out to all my guests because I wanted to keep in touch with them. And so she would write to me and she would tell me what was happening. Well, three months later, I got an email from the pastor. And he said, Emmanuel, today we baptized Diane's husband into the Adventist church. And you know, when, when I got that email, and by the way, to this day, if you go there, Diane is a deaconess at the church. She still faithfully attends. Um, just as a side note, public evangelism, it still works. Can you say amen? And I'm saying that only because I know your pastor here is an evangelist, and I know some churches got, have gotten away from this, but I want to encourage, when I go places, I want to encourage people, do public evangelism. It's not the only means to win people, but it is a means. And the Lord knows you guys still have some seats left in the church for people to come to sit in, right? <laughs> so the point is that when Diane made that decision, she easily could have yielded to what her natural inclination was. Let's just make my husband happy. Let's be happy. Let's not have fighting at home. Let's just go the easy route. But she said, no, I want to follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus is to deny yourself. And even though you know that it's not your natural inclination, it's the Father's will in heaven. Amen? And she said, I'm going to do it. And she made a stand. You know, I know people who have been in relationships. They were dating, and the person they were dating was beautiful and handsome and well-educated, made a lot of money, but they were not a believer. And when, you know, when the truth comes, I know that some people, they just think, well, you know, I know people that did this and they ended up becoming, you know, they converted them and, you know, and I know people that reason like that and they think, you know what, so-and-so did it and they were fine. But I also know of people, and I'm making it gender, uh, you know, not gender specific because I know of more than one couple where they made the decision, you know what, God can't be in this. And even though they love the other person, they said, you know what, God said, don't be unequally yoked. And so I'm, I'm going to walk away, even though I love this person, because I know that's the will of my Father in heaven. I got to tell you that that is the sign that a person is really willing to follow Jesus. We can say, oh, I follow Jesus, I come to church, I pay tithe, I do these things. Really, the essence of following Jesus is to deny yourself and to take up the cross. You know, folks, every person has a different cross. And that, but every person has a cross to bear. And I know that for some of you in here tonight, there's a struggle. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I know that if you're serious about following Jesus, I know that there is some cross that Jesus is asking you to carry. I knew a young woman that made, came to one of my meetings. Her whole family was non-Christian. She was from Japan. And her whole family was like, you know, they, I don't know, what, but they were not Christian at all. But she had, had the privilege of attending an Adventist school, but had never been invited to become part of the Adventist church. And I made an appeal, and she made a decision. She knew that this would cause a, a like, it would stir things up back at home. But she made the decision, and I praise God, she's attending Arise. Do you know what Arise is? It's like, a, it's like a resource institute for soul winning and evangelism. It's a missionary training school. She went there for four months. And God knows, not only should you get, because she got baptized after the meetings, she got baptized, but then she went to Arise, and by God's grace, she's going to be a missionary for God. You know, what, sometimes we go against our families, and it's not easy. And I'm not trying to encourage us to rebel against family. That's not the point. But if God's will, if God's cross for you is to do that, if you deny yourself, you are truly taking up the cross to follow Jesus. Everybody has some cross to bear. You know, when, when Simon of Cyrene took up that cross, I believe that in a literal sense, it brought him close to Jesus. And you know, I believe that when we take up the cross, it draws us closer to Jesus. 
Because Jesus, by his example, he showed us to deny his human desires and he did the Father's will. And when we do the same, it brings us into closer fellowship with Jesus. Following Jesus is not just studying the Bible. It's not just praying. It's not just sharing your faith. Following Jesus is also carrying the cross. You know, when Simon of Cyrene took up the cross, if we take the idea that he took up the back end, are you with me? In other words, Jesus carried the front part and Simon was carrying the lighter part that might have been dragging on the ground. If he did that, does it make sense that Simon had to follow in the very footsteps of Jesus? Does that make sense? Now, folks, this is a simple point, but Jesus said this. He said, he said uh, take my yoke upon you, right? Now, I can't think of something that's more parallel to this point of carrying the cross because when Simon carried that cross, he had to literally follow wherever Jesus went. And this is the exact symbolism of the yoke that Jesus speaks of. When you're yoked with Jesus or when you're carrying the cross with Jesus, does it make sense that you have to surrender your will? Does that make sense? Because Jesus is not going to go where you want. You got to go where Jesus wants. Does that make sense? And that right away implies that in the being yoked with Christ or bearing the cross, you have to surrender yourself. But there's more than that. Because when you're yoked with Christ and you're doing his will, that implies that you are in obedience to his will, which is really embodied in his law, the Ten Commandments. Does that make sense? So being yoked with Christ or carrying the cross is another symbol of living a life of obedience. You know, many Christians today, we don't understand the po- where, where does the power come Where do we get the strength to live righteously? Where does it come from? And the truth is that you can know what's right and still not do it. But Jesus said he invites us to learn of him. And as we are yoked with Christ in that yoke together, we are empowered to live right. And practically speaking, practically speaking, how do we become yoked with Christ? Well, in the, in the most simple way, I would say this. It's through personal Bible study and prayer. You're making a conscious decision that you want God to dwell in your heart. That's what you're doing. And when you do that, you actually are united with Christ. And as you are united with him, you will have the power to live right. Practically. All right. One more point I want to make here. You know, by, by carrying the cross, Simon was working for and with Jesus. Now, can I say that there are some people that come to church and they love to listen to truth, but if you ask them, what are you doing for Jesus? I got to tell you that there are people today, there are two extremes that I see. There are some people that are very, very active and zealous for the cause, but sometimes they neglect the heart preparation. You know what I'm talking about? The other extreme is there are people that are focused on character development, but they're not busy winning souls. God wants us to have a balance of both. Does that make sense? And folks, I want to say this. It's not because I'm I'm, I'm an evangelist, but everyone that gets to heaven has won somebody. Does that make sense? Everybody, if you are in heaven, it's because you have labored for souls, and in the process of doing that, you have worked out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Does that make sense? I don't want to say that we, work, we earn our salvation by works. I'm not saying that. But what I want to say is that everyone that gets to the kingdom, by doing so in the process of getting there, will bring others with them. And you know, Simon, when he was carrying that cross, he was working with Jesus. 
I want to ask you a rhetorical question. You don't have to tell me, but I want to ask you, what are you doing for Jesus? What work are you doing? You know, not everybody can preach, but everybody can win somebody. There are people in this community that I could never reach, but you could reach them. There are people in your family that I could never reach, but you could reach them. And folks, we have a privilege. We have the opportunity to work with Jesus to win souls. Amen? And, you know, I, I spoke with your pastor, and I actually, your pastor has an evangelistic meeting that he does called The Evidence, and I actually got it from him. And I'm going to use it next week in Malaysia. I'm going to actually borrow some of his presentations because they're appropriate for that environment. But, you know, I'm always excited. Like, don't get me wrong. A week of prayer and a revival like this is a blessing for me. I don't always get to preach non-evangelistic sermons. So I enjoy this. But when I start an opening, like when I start an evangelistic series, an opening night comes and people say, oh, we have guests here, Pastor. There's guests that are from the community. There's nothing that gets me as excited as knowing that there are people that don't know this truth that are about to learn it straight from the Bible. That's an exciting feeling. I don't know if you can understand how, how I feel, but that's something that is so exhilarating for me, and it's been a passion of mine that I've pursued for the last 15 years. But I want you to know that you can experience that same thing. It could be in a little room one-on-one -on -one studying the Bible with someone. It could be that you can post something that will lead people to click on a link for Bible studies on Facebook. I, I don't know what it is, but everybody can do something to help win souls for Jesus. You know, I'm talking about Simon of Cyrene, but I do want to take a moment right now to finish out. Now, big overview, we've been looking at the life of Christ, and we've been focusing on those closing scenes. But as I shared from the first night, all of those scenes have their parallel to the experience of God's people at the end of time. And if maybe during this series you were skeptical, like, you know, I'm not so sure. Maybe he's stretching things a little bit. Tonight, I hope to cement that idea unmistakably in your minds with what I'm about to share with you. Now, I'm going to go through some quotes, and there's a lot of them, so forgive me if I kind of push through. But as we read these statements, it's unmistakable to see that what Jesus went through on the road to Calvary, the experience with the mob, the trials, everything that he went through has another parallel for God's people at the end. Please notice what I'm, as I share these next statements with you. Through fear of losing his power and authority, Pilate consented to the death of Jesus. What was he afraid of losing? His power. I'm going to talk about him tomorrow. It says in Great Controversy 592, the dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor, Sunday, honor the Sunday. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. Now, I, I never talk about politics because, for one thing, I don't know enough about it. But I will tell you this. It doesn't matter which side of the issue you stand on. No one can deny that we live in an age that is rife with political corruption. It doesn't matter which administration you want to look at. The point is that we live in that time. Notice what she, we are told in Great Controversy. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. Is that true today, yes or no? More than ever before. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure what? Public favor will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. I want to ask you, why did Pilate condemn Jesus? Why? He was afraid. He didn't want to lose his public power. And why will the powers at the end of time capitulate to the religious pressure of the religious leaders? Because they don't want to lose public favor. Now notice what Caiaphas reasoned. Notice this from John 11. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, 
nor consider that it is expedient for us that how many? One man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now notice his reasoning. It's better that one man perish than the whole nation. Notice from Great Controversy, page 615. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them, that small group, to suffer than for the whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same reasoning The same argument many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. This argument will appear conclusive, and a decree will be finally issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Did you read that, folks? Did you read that a law is coming that will make it legal for people to persecute and punish God's people to death. I don't know if you know, there's countries like that right now in the world. Like, you know, in the Philippines, if you're suspected of being a drug trafficker, they skip the the due process of trial law, and they just, they're authorized to just kill you. But, you know, this sounds almost like some of these modern films, like, well, I won't get into that, but all right. Um, Early writings 175, with shouts of triumph, they led the dear Savior away. That's, uh, that's talking about Jesus. But notice in great controversy, with shouts of triumph, jeering and imprecations, throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. This is speaking of God's people during the time of trouble. Same thing, almost the same language. It was an hour of fearful, terrible agony to the saints. Day and night they cried unto God for deliverance. To our appearance, there was no possibility of their escape. The wicked had already begun to triumph, crying out, Why doesn't your God deliver you out of our hands? Why don't you go up and save your lives? But the saints heeded them not. That is a direct, direct parallel to whose experience? Jesus. They said, Hey, you saved others. Save yourself. And this is exactly the same language that's being used for God's people again at the end of time. Now notice this. The angels who hovered over the scene of Christ's crucifixion were moved to indignation as the rulers derided him and said, if he be the Son of God, let him deliver himself. They wished there to come to the rescue of Jesus and deliver him, but they were not suffered to do so. The object of his mission was not yet accomplished. So there was angels. They wanted to help Jesus, but God said, not yet. Not yet. He has to finish the work that was given to him. Notice early writings, page 272. Soon after they had commenced their earnest cry, this is God's people at the end of time, the angels in sympathy desired to go to their deliverance, but the tall commanding angel suffered them not. He said, the will of God is not yet fulfilled. They must drink of the cup. They must be baptized with the baptism. Now, folks, I hope you don't lose sight in the midst of me reading all these statements. Can you see that what Jesus went through in the closing scenes of his life, God's people will be called to go through similar circumstances once more at the very end of time? I don't share this to scare you, but if you understand what's coming, now is the time to begin preparation to have oil in the vessels, not just in the lamps. Can you say amen? Amen. I think some of you understand what that means. All right. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2. This is speaking of Jesus now. and This is where we get into the faith of Jesus. He had not one ray of light to brighten the future. And he was struggling with the power of Satan who was declaring that he had Christ in his power. When Jesus was prepared to to, to, to carry the sins of man, the Bible, or we're told that he had not one ray of light to brighten the future. It was darkness. Let's, let me keep reading. Faith and hope trembled in the expiring agonies of Christ because God had removed the assurance he had heretofore given his beloved son of his approbation and acceptance. The Redeemer of the world then relied upon the evidences which had hitherto strengthened him that his father accepted his labors and was pleased with his work. Now, folks, As Jesus was on the cross, 
There was a darkness of understanding. Jesus did not know that his sacrifice was accepted. He didn't have that assurance. And so we're told that what Jesus relied upon was all of the previous evidences of God's acceptance and favor in his life up until that point. There are some of you in here tonight that may be going through a trial right now where you cannot see God's hand working on your behalf at all. But we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget how the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. I want to ask you, has God worked in your life in the past in a miraculous way, yes or no? If he has, those miracles, those experiences, those evidences of divine intervention, they should encourage you when you cannot see God's hand working in your life at this time. We need the faith of Jesus. When Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb, Jesus relied on the faith of what God had done in the past in his life. I want to read a couple more statements. In his dying agony, he yields up his precious life. He has by faith alone to trust in him who it has ever been his joy to obey. He is not cheered with clear, bright rays of hope on the right hand nor on the left. All is enshrouded in oppressive gloom. Now here's where it applies to us. Oh, for a living act of faith. We need it. We must have it or we shall faint and fail in the day of trial. The darkness that will then at that time rest upon our path must not discourage us or drive us to despair. It is the veil with which God covers his glory when he comes to impart rich blessings. We should know this by our what? Past experiences. Can I share something with you? I've been very open with you about my life, and I've been pretty clear to you that I've gone through some pretty difficult trials. Can I tell you I've noticed a pattern, and maybe some of you can see this in your own life. When I look back in my life, and I see the most difficult circumstances that I've ever gone through, Almost without fail, on the tail end of that trial is one of the greatest experiences that I've ever gone through. Can you say amen to that? I don't know if it's just me, but I've noticed that. When I go through things that are like earth-shatteringly difficult, when I finally make it through, I have found that some of the richest blessings that I have ever experienced are waiting for me on the other side. I know that some of you are going through some things right now. And I pray that your faith can endure when you can't see God's hands to trust because God's worked in your life in the past. I'm going to read just a few more and then we'll have a prayer. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint, though severely tried. Those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for his blessing, will not obtain it. Now, I want you to look at this verse. I know that many of you are familiar with this verse, but I want to read it for you in a way that maybe you never thought of before. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, what's the next word there? They keep. So now look. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Now, when you see that word and, it's implied that you carry the word keep over. Does that make sense? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and they keep, what else? The faith of Jesus. If they keep the faith of Jesus, that means that they must have already had the faith of Jesus. Does that make sense? And what kind of faith of Jesus is that? When Jesus was on the cross, when that darkness enshrouded him, when Jesus could not see forward, the faith of Jesus relied upon all the evidences of divine favor in his past. And it was that faith of Jesus that got him through that dark time. If you have the faith of Jesus tonight, 
If you're one of these people that are keeping the commandments of God and you're keeping the faith of Jesus, it means that your faith, like a radar, I like this illustration because, you know, a, a, a radar, you don't, need, you don't need a radar when it's daytime. Does that make sense? Because you can see everything. You know, you can just see it, right? I had a church member, by the way, um, a, 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 one of the most godly people that I had in my congregation, just a, a saint. And he used to fly. He flew his own plane. And he told me as he got older, his, his eyesight started to fail. And he said that sometimes, I don't know if this was legal, but he said sometimes when he'd get kind of lost as to where he'd go, he was going, he'd fly really low and he'd look at like the highway signs to figure out where he was flying. <laughs> But when he couldn't, when he couldn't, when, when, he, when he had, when he had the, the, the light, he could see. Does that make sense? You need the radar at night. Does that make sense? When you can't see, but the radar tells you that, hey, something is there. Amen? And some of you, that faith that you need is like that radar. Even though you can't see, God's promises shine in the darkness. And they let you know that God's presence will be with you if you'll meet the conditions that he's outlined in his word. Tonight, I want to ask you to take your hymnal. I'm going to ask Audrey to come and play a hymn for us. It's hymn number 328. And you know what? This is a short hymn. It's very short, but it's a beautiful hymn. And it goes right along with what we've talked about tonight. And friends, as we sing this hymn, I want you to sing these words as a prayer. And tonight, maybe for some of you, there is a cross that Jesus wants you to bear. I don't know what it is, but I know that if we follow, Je- if we really follow Jesus, there is a cross to bear. And so if you want to say to Jesus tonight, Lord, Help me. Give me the strength. Let me bear that cross with you. And if you want to make that decision as we sing this hymn, I'm going to ask you to join me here in the front. We're going to have a prayer together. I'm going to ask the elder to come up and he's going to pray for us. But let's sing number 328. And if God is speaking to your heart,